Good morning. Good morning, yes. So we had lined up for you a really awesome speaker. Um, Nick Mastrude, he's just this awesome guy. He's so hip. He's so young. He's so amazing, a minister in Portland. And his family got sick, so he wasn't able to come. And we found out yesterday morning. So that's why you're stuck with it. Oh, guy, he's just barely creeping along in life, and you're going to have to live with this this morning. Okay, so kind of uh, fun uh, to be up here with you and to challenge you. I know Nick would have done an amazing job. He's just encouraging to me. And the great thing is, though, he's also from Baker City. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Oh, man. So... Yeah, but he's still from Baker City. Yeah, Lens. So, yeah, and he's gone to Portland as a missionary. So, today we're talking about mission-driven habits. And as we take a look at this, mission-driven transformation brings a life of new habits, mission-driven habits. And have you ever heard the old expression, raised by a pack of wolves? Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, explains a lot about me because I am from Eastern Oregon and Mr. Herod, we're both from Eastern Oregon. And we were kind of raised by a pack of wolves. Only, uh, yeah, I think his were Christian wolves, right? Mine weren't for a long time. But it's kind of how I see the world. We have so many expectations to the world to meet uh, our mold. But really, think about it. They don't have any of the convictions any of the direction, any of the habits of God. So why would we expect that of them? The problem is, though, is that we don't always separate ourselves from the world in regards to our habits. So as we take a look at these things today, I love how James puts it in James 1, 21 through 22. He says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, And receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word. That's habits, by the way. Develop the habits of the word and not be hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So let's take on that tonight or today. Well, I don't even know what time of day it is anymore. Yeah, it's it's been a tough week. So. You see, we are to live new lives through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or we don't really understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that's what puts us in the presence of God and to live a life for God. Romans puts it this way. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Know this, that our old life was crucified, and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Amen? Amen. To live a resurrected life, we need to know and do several things. And that reflects out of Romans and also going to be in our passage today. If we don't understand this, we need to, that we have to live toward a new orientation in our life. We need a new identity. We have a new identity, which requires us to develop new habits which are consistent with that identity. And if we're not doing it, James also goes on to say, do you really have that faith then? So Peter also talks about that, by the way. So let's take a look in our Bibles. Holding this thing is hard. You notice I never do motions and singing, and I can't do more than one thing at a time. So holding this mic is a challenge, but we'll get it. We'll make it work. So take a look with me, with your Bibles, in 1 Corinthians. No. Colossians, I told you it's been a tough week. Colossians 3, 1 through 17. But we'll try to make this work with all this paper. All right.
right. You got your Bibles out? Yeah, get them out. Colossians 3. Yes. And what did I say the verses were? There we go. I just need you to remind me. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. This is kind of like a, a sermon devotion on the spot, you know, um, after teaching kids last night. All right, let's read this together. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Isn't that a picture? Yeah. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, which are on this earth and focused on earth, the things of fornication, uncleanliness, uh, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon some of the uh, disobedient, in which you yourselves once, notice that past tense, once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. Get it out of your mouth. And do not lie to one another since you have put off the old person with his deeds and have put on the new person, the new life, who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, uh, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, even if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is beyond is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right, there's our passage. Challenging passage, don't you think? As we take a look at this today. And the first thing it does is it brings us to a new orientation. A new orientation. What have you focused your eyes on? What have you focused your vision on? What have you focused your direction toward? And I would say a lot of us haven't lived out Romans 6. We haven't put to death, crucified that old life and the vision that goes with it. But when you think about it, it's a practical application in our life. Because whatever we focus on, fix our eyes on, that's what we live towards. And this is very important to having the right habits. Because if you don't do this, you can't have the right habits. It's kind of like I grew up on a farm, a ranch, whatever you want to call it. And I remember when my dad was teaching me to plow. He said, son, remember, you look to where you want to go to keep your rows straight. All right? So you're not looking to whether you're crooked or going off track. You look to the destination, and if you do that, you'll be amazed. Have you ever driven around here and seen all these rows and stuff? These tractors are pretty amazing now because they can have all this computer stuff that helps them. But in the day, you just did it with your eyes to get all of your rows straight and plowed accordingly so it wasn't just chaos everywhere. Well, it's the same thing in many other things. Any of you play basketball? 
So if you had a really good coach in how to shoot, they tell you how to fix your eyes. And if you want to go for the swoosh, where do you fix your eyes? On the back of the rim. Yeah. So it shoots up and it drops right in front of it. And people that don't learn that are always doinging off the front of the rim and they can't get it to fall because you got the wrong focus point. And so your mechanics are off. Um, let me see. How about driving? Yeah. Did you have a good driving teacher? They don't teach you to worry about whether you're in this line or what's around. They, they teach you to look down the road to stay in your lane, right? So it's where you fix your eyes. And I can give you example after example. Even in football, if there's someone that's running away with the ball and you're like the DB or something that's going to head them off, you don't fix your eye on what they're doing. You fix it where? Where they're going to catch them. So it's all about how we focus. And that is really true with your Christian life. If you're just worried about this day and how do I get through it and all the problems you have, things going on in our culture, all of that kind of stuff, you have the wrong orientation. You have the wrong focus. And you'll be tossed back and forth. You have to fix your eyes upon heaven, upon Christ in heaven. Because when you take a look at it, the focus on heaven and on Christ who sits at the right hand, that will establish the right foundation in our minds that informs our actions to live out our faith for his mission. Okay? We set our focus on the things of earth, then we lose the ability to have mission-driven habits and impact. So, what we're living for is heaven right now. We need to practice seeing Christ in all that we do for the sake of heaven. And when you fix your eyes on that, it even overcomes your own disappointments of yourself, your own shortcomings. Because it's not dependent on you, it's dependent on Christ for the sake of heaven. Next, when you do all of this, you have to have a new identity. And quite truthfully, I think this is one of the hardest things for us to do. Because in many ways, we're tied to our earthly identity. And there's some aspects of it we love and don't want to give up. But the plain and simple fact is you have to. You have to take on this new identity. Uh, if you take a look at uh, Colossians 3, 9 through 12 there, it's talking about the whole aspect that answers. I know it requires me to do this finagle. All right. So. Let's read it again. Therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on your tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. It's right there. And if you read down through there, um, four, let's pick it up at 14. But above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And the peace of the Lord God rule in your heart, to which you were called in one body. And be thankful. The whole point there, as we see it, we are no longer what we were. We now are totally different. We are the elect of God, holy and beloved by him. You see that identity? Three of the greatest needs of teens, adults, is in regard to three things. Identity, affinity, and purpose. Okay? Guys, this isn't confusing. God has resolved all of those for us. And it's essential to understand this if you're going to have new habits. You are redeemed image bearers through Jesus Christ. You're carrying the image of God. You belong to God. That's your affinity. Affinity is where do I fit in? Is you belong to God through Christ. You belong in the kingdom. You are the body of Christ. You know where you fit if you've truly crucified your old life and have been resurrected to a new life. Glorify God and serve his kingdom mission. That's our purpose. 
to glorify God in all we do and to advance his kingdom. So what this means is our nationality doesn't define us. Being American, it's cool. I love my country greatly. But being an American does not define me. Jesus defines me. Um, race does not define me. Yeah, I'm a certain race, and like most Americans, I'm a mutt. You know, I'm like German, Scottish, Irish, all sorts of things. Okay, that doesn't define me. My past does not define me. Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. Because people that knew me in my past would be like, you're a what? A preacher? Oh, my goodness. Life truly is crazy. Because they knew my past. But your past does not define you. All right? Our sin doesn't define us. And I know that's what this devil, Satan, desires to hold against us, is our sin, our failure to be holy. But it does not define us. Our appetites and desires don't define us. That's our culture. Our culture wants to say these things define us. They do not. They are not your masters. They do not define you because you are defined by Jesus Christ. So when you think about that, we are Christians. It says in the passage there that Christ is in all and through all. All right? He is all. And you really have to do that. So I was working with a student, and they were struggling a little bit um, with things. And this is a long, long time ago. And it came down to something that we just, we came to, and he agreed with. His problem with, not only the college, but the church, was that he had just never submitted his whole life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You see, my fellow brothers and sisters, we can't have these habits unless Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That is something we really have to do. So with that new identity, now we can move to habits. And they have them up on the board. And you see all those old habits. Yeah, nice laundry list. And we're, we're like, okay, which ones am I? That's not the point. The point is, all of those represent living and focusing on the earth. Our desires and passions so from impurity down to lying, slander, malice, wrath, anger. But look at the other list. Those are all based upon who God is and that you are a redeemed image bearer. These should be, these are the habits you were created for. You see what I'm saying? Those other ones are alien to God. They're not what God intended. They're not what God ever expected for you. So give them up. Get rid of them. Because you have crucified that life. To be raised to a new life of living what God intended. Showing compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving, loving. That's what you were created for. We kind of think about these on the right side, the green ones. We kind of think about those are the alien ones we're being asked to live out. But they're actually what was intended. They're the natural thing. And think about it. When you're in that environment, it is healthy. It is good because it's what God intended. And so you've got to think about, are you in the right orientation? Do you have the right or identity? Because if you don't, you will reject the right for the left because you're living for the earth and your own desires. So I don't think I have to go on, but like I said, it's a little bit of devotion today. But these habits are so important. I want to give you some practical advice. When I was sitting in your seats, um, I was still living pretty much the old me, just to be honest. I was living a lot on the left because the new life I hadn't really orientated myself to Hadn't really taken on that identity, which I imagine there's some of you here that just like I was. And uh, I hadn't adopted the habits of a Christ follower because I hadn't crucified my old self completely. 
But you see, there's no, partial, there's no partial solution. You can't partially crucify yourself. Just think about it. You can't partially crucify yourself. You either do it or you don't. So to take on these habits. So let's say you do. Well, it's going to take intentionality then to live that new life with the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word. Okay? So think about it this way. I, 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 this is just what I did in my own silly mind. You can do what you want. But I came up with four things. The minute, because I had a problem with a number of these things, you have to recognize it. So every time it happens, recognize it. Don't ignore it. Don't act like it, it's no big thing. Recognize it. It is a thing. It's not a habit of Christ followers. Okay? Then reject it. Don't just recognize it and, and you know what we do, right? We figure out a way to make it okay. No, reject it. It's not of God. If it's not on the right and it's on the left, reject it. So immediately, and it's called living in a reflective way, your faith. Reject it. Then you need to replace it. Replace it. Redirect that. Replace it with holiness, with something on the right. Okay? And then you just keep repeating that, and you'll be amazed. One day, you'll be a totally different creation because you've been allowing God to shape and transform you. Because I can tell you, when I was sitting where you are, you wouldn't even recognize me, hopefully. <laughs> That's a hope. I don't think you would recognize me from who I am today, and I'll give you a couple examples. I have filthy language. Now, I didn't use some of the words they use today, but I did use the other words. And I remember several activities around here that I actually – an expletive came out. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, whoops, no biggie. Until I was convicted by my youth minister that I actually was here at one activity, and she was like, what? Why are you still doing that? Great question, right? And so I had to come up with that. So even after that, you know, I had to work intentionally with that. You know how hard it is to change your speaking habits, your expression habits? Because the hardest one, I finally did get rid of it, almost. I still had a few in ministry. But when I, when I like, hit my thumb with a hammer, I had to go to a new practice. I don't say anything. For a long time, I just wouldn't say anything. Because if I did, it might be the wrong thing. And I don't think anything other than, mm, oh, that hurts. Okay? Right? And then... I did take on some of the Christian swearing there for a time in my life, which I think all of us go through, Christian swearing, you know. And, uh, and all the people that are non-Christians know it. And even my youth group knew it. So I used to have this saying, instead of saying, you know, Jesus' name wrong, I would say cheese and crackers. And Kevin in my youth group goes, hey, Russell, isn't that the same thing as saying Jesus Christ? Man, um, aren't you supposed to be going home right now? <laughs> you know? So I even helped question my trying to make things okay, which I love teenagers because they will do that. So change it. Anger. So I just had to methodically every time think, nope, not going to say anything. What I do say is just going to be my honest feeling, not an unholy word. Okay. Next, anger. I was an angry, I, I had anger. And there were times when, you know, like poor Amber had to witness my anger to her embarrassment. Well, again, how are you going to change that? You got to recognize it. You got to reject it. You got to replace it. Right? So my thing was, if I was getting upset, I just walked away. That was the best thing I could do at the time. And then today, it's changed tremendously. I've had people in my face. You will have people in your face. They will call you everything under the sun just because you're trying to do well, and they're upset about something. And it's even gone farther, farther than that. I, I got to the point where I could say, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. So how can I help you? But then it goes even further to... Um, Man, when I see people like that, 
when they call me the F word or something, it's like, wow, I'm so sorry. In fact, this is probably my show about a lot of things and how miserable their life must be that way. And that goes down to how I picked up on doing some positive things like having empathy and love, not seeing for how it impacted me, but thinking about what is causing that in the other person. Why, why are they going through such distress? Why are they having such pain? Why is their life in chaos? And that's so bad. I mean, it's sad. I'm so sorry. It helped me change a lot of things to come over to the right. And you need to think about those things, but only if you intentionally go through the process. Uh, I used to be put myself first. You know how to fear putting yourself first? A good pra practice. Because, man, I mean, if it was the, the buffet line open, I don't care if it was a little old lady or a little kid. They might be trampled for me to get there first, right? So how do you stop that? How do you change that pattern? Number one, you got to recognize it, that you're a selfish ingrate. Second, you've got to do what? Reject that because it's not right. Then you got to replace it. So how do you replace it? Oh, it's not that hard. Thank you, Gabe. You put yourself last. And make that as a principle. So even Amber can tell you that, even at home, I always eat last. And that can, <laughs> when you get as many of us as we are now, that can be a while. But on the other hand, it's not like I need any more food, right? So it's one of those things. Do intentional things to change your habits. Because we're living to develop the habits of the right and put to death the habits of the left. And, of course, those lists could go on and on if we looked at other scripture. But if you're going to have mission-driven habits that are submitted to Christ to carry out his mission and transform the world, we as Christians have to be different. And right now, let's just face it, we not, we're not always different. We're pretty much the same sometimes. So my prayer for you is as we take a look and go from this list to the next one, is just to read this together. So, let's read this together out loud. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. So it's interesting when Paul ends up this passage in, or his book in four, um, he ends with a prayer for them to continue to grow, but then he asks for a prayer for him, that they can continue, and at this time, he's in prison. And for them, even though he's in chains, that God... <laughs> will give him the opportunities, this is just crazy sauce, the opportunities to continue to serve and spread the word of the gospel. Because remember, his orientation was to heaven in Christ, seated there. His identity was in Christ to carry out the mission of Christ, and his habits were always and you think of all those stories, to glorify God and all that he did so that he could bring heaven to earth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us be the people that have truly submitted to you, that have crucified our own self-interest, our own identity, our own fleshly desires with Christ in baptism so that we can ra be raised to walk in a new life for our habits personify you God for our habits bring glory to you God for our habits bring light to all the people around us for our habits cause people to say wow that truly is not of this earth so that they can see you in heaven in Jesus name Amen <laughs>